place in Islam, but dreams can only affirm the, the main role of dreams in, in Islam is Bushra, to give some glad tidings to alert you about something that you've been uh, stressed about or something that may help you or save you in the future. Uh, it's a, usually a minor thing. It's a form of a miracle or a reassurance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the believers. And the Prophet ﷺ said towards the end of times, which is what we're living in now, as times get more and more tough, the true believers will receive more true dreams. But it's very important to understand true dreams in the way that it is understood in Islam. A dream in Islam can never change the faith. In Islam, a dream can never change the faith. Meaning if Allah says there's prayers five times a day, and then you see a dream that tells you, well, now you only have to pray four or six. That's not from Allah. That's from shaitan. And nobody should follow you or do anything. And first of all, you should not accept that yourself. But nobody should follow a person who makes those claims. Now, if a person receives a dream and says that, uh, well, women don't have to wear hijab anymore. Or uh, there's, I saw a dream that so-and-so is a righteous man. We should all follow him and become his students. These are all nonsense. This is all BS. The reason why this, excuse me for that language, but my point being with that is that um, this in our ummah today is one of the main deviation factors in our ummah today. Uh, I don't know, not even thousands, millions of people around the world, they will follow a leader who claims to be Muslim, who's doing the most bizarre things. I'm sure you've seen videos online. Have you seen those things? Where, for example, the guy's He's like, it looks like a sheikh. He has a turban on, big beard, has a walking stick. He's sitting in a, a, a chair that's a lot more grand than this one. And there's like a, a, a hundred people waiting in line. And then they, they put some money down and he blows into the, like they give him like a, their water bottle or their container. He says some mumbo jumbo and he blows into it. And next, and next, next. These videos are very common. Or he like says something on his hands and rubs their shirt or something. And that, this is very common. By the way, you see these videos in parts of the Muslim world and you see them in America too. You see them in America, where, the, but in that case, the person is Christian. And he, he claims to have like divine inspiration, or he claims to be like a, a very righteous leader. And so people get duped. And they say, well, I want this righteous leader to give me some blessings. So they go to him. And this is very common, by the way. It's unfortunate. It's alhamdulillah, in Islam, it's not the majority. I want you to understand the difference between the majority, meaning most people deal with it, or most people have fallen for it. Alhamdulillah, we don't have that problem. But it doesn't mean that it's not very common. Okay? You can't say 90% or 80% of the Muslims or 70 fall for it, but still 10, 20, 30% fall for it, and that's still hundreds of millions of people. And it's very, very sad. It's unfortunate. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said in an authentic hadith, as the day of judgment draws near, more Dajjalun will appear. Dajjalun, it comes from the word Dajjal, which means the Antichrist or the great... Dajjal literally means the great liar or the, the, the great deceiver. And of course, the Dajjal, the ultimate deceiver, will be the one on... Uh, at the end of times, who will uh, fight against Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, the return of Jesus. However, the Prophet ﷺ said, up until the Dajjal comes, the greatest one, the worst one rather, there will be other ones who will dupe a lot of people. So um, I know this is not the topic of our conversation today, but I'm glad that I landed here because I get this question all the time when people say, I prayed this Tikhara. Uh, I was told that when you pray Tikhara, you should wait for a dream to show up. No, no, absolutely not. It may, it may show up. But it is not mentioned in Quran or Sunnah that a dream is meant to show up. It can, but it's pretty rare. That's not usually how Allah answers your istikhara. If, if, if people want to focus, like if people want to ask about that, we can talk about it more at length, inshallah, towards the end of our session today. However, be very of, wary of people following dreams. Dreams in Islam are true, uh, or they, 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 they can play a role, but the Prophet ﷺ said they are limited to giving you a bushra, giving you glad tidings about. Uh, the future, so you can reassure your heart, uh, so your heart can be uh, reassured during difficult times. So, for example, during the Bosnian War uh, in, in the 90s, many, many of the Muslims went and joined uh, for jihad, and they went to support their Bosnian brothers and sisters. And um, even after the war was over, the Bosnian government was very grateful, and they issued them citizenship. And they, it, it was... It, it was a, it, the, a lot of the Muslim Ummah felt it was a new beginning for the unity of the Ummah. But of course, the imperial and colonial powers made sure to step in and to cause as much harm as they could to separate the Ummah. And this is a very recurring theme that you see in our era. However, I mentioned the Bosnian War because there was a lot of mashayikh, a lot of scholars who had went, and they report that the people there, because of the suffering that the Bosnians had to go through with being genocided by the Serbs, 
and the, the, the Muslims struggling for a greater cause, a lot of Muslims report having seen uh, Bushra, having seen true dreams. Like you see a dream, then it comes true a few days later or a few weeks later. And this is Allah reassuring your heart that you are doing the right thing and that you're standing up for the truth. Um, and, and Allah uh, alerting you that you're doing the right thing, inshallah. However, we don't take legislation from dreams. We don't allow somebody to change the faith from a dream uh, and so on and so forth. Any questions on that? Even though it's not our topic, I felt like it's, it's, it's important to know the distinction. Any questions on that? Yes. Yes. No, no, Jazakul Khairan. A dream can be a warning, yes. Dreams in Islam, they will give you some alert about the future. Uh, or they will either reassure you that you're doing the right thing. Uthbut, you know, isbr. Be patient, you're doing the right thing, and, and inshallah things will get better. Or they will t alert, it will alert you that you're, in, you're doing something wrong and you're taking the wrong decision. That's where people's sort of misconception about istikhara comes in. Where they say, uh, when you pray istikhara, you're saying, Oh Allah, should I take this step or not? Should I marry this person? Should I take this job? Should I move to this place? Should I make this big decision? So when, when that happens, a person is, they, they, they get this false, um, uh, some people give this wrong impression that wait until a dream tells you yes or no. No, no. It may happen, but it's, it's not, the Prophet ﷺ did not guarantee that it would. In fact, Allah answers the istikhara in other ways more commonly. However, whether you pray the istikhara or not, it may be that Allah will send you a dream to alert you that you're doing the right thing or you're doing the wrong thing. Usually during times of extreme difficulty and what we see in Gaza, what, what will happen to the Bosnians during, uh, in the 90s and so on. Usually you get a lot of reports from trustworthy people, from mashayikh, from honor, honorable, honest people who say either they saw the dream or somebody reported it. And it's found in our sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ said towards the end of times, as the ummah goes through more difficulty, Allah will send true dreams to the believers to reassure them, to give them strength. Uh, that's the main role of a dream, to give you some alert about the future. Um, but here's, here's one thing I will say though Is if a person is not being righteous in their life They should not give a lot of value to dreams Shaitan has more control over you If you go to sleep, you didn't pray your Aisha And you go to sleep And then you see a dream and you say you put a lot of value to it Shaitan was, had full access to you at that time You didn't say Ayat al-Kursi before you went to bed The Prophet ﷺ said to seek protection from the devils Before you go to bed, say Ayat al-Kursi So you're giving yourself a protection If you did none of that, then Shaitan has full access to you he can, he can give you the, the ideas and, and make you feel like it is a dream. Uh, make it feel like it is uh, a true dream. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on this topic? I think it's, it's uh, relevant. People deal with it all the time. All right. If, 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 if I'm reminded at the end, we can talk about istikhara, how we can do it, how we can expect for it to be answered, that kind of thing. I think it's, uh, uh, it's a recurring topic for people. All right. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. I want to start the conversation, I, I, I am planning, I know I told you, I, I'm, I want to start a mini-series for the summer about the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. And I, uh, coincidentally, complete coincidence, his story starts off with a dream as well. Uh, however, my only concern with that is the, uh, we keep having breaks, like you know, we had Eid break, we have a camping trip coming up, and so we won't be able to f uh, finish the story in order. However, today, I am pausing, I'm not starting it yet because I want to let you guys know ahead of time. My goal is to start it next week. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, that is the goal. Next week will be the first session about the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. That is next week, bi'ithnillah. However, today, because it's, more, it's relevant to our time, I want to speak about the hijrah. The hijrah. Why would hijrah be relevant? First of all, what is hijrah? What is it? Okay, to, which is, in another word, to leave your birthplace to somewhere else. Migration. And the, when I say the hijrah, which one am I referring to? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He made hijrah from Mecca to Medina, right? Not the other way around. From Mecca to Medina. And that was called the hijrah. Why am I saying that it's relevant now? No. But it's good. I'm, I'm glad. No, I'm glad. Listen, you have, to, you have to take a guess, but I'm glad. Why is it relevant right now? Most of us are first generation born here. So our parents did make hijrah. Okay, but that's, not what I, that's good too, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something much simpler than that. Why is it important to talk about hijrah right now? Yes, Dhul Hijjah. We have another week or so until the Islamic New Year. Which is, the Islamic New Year is based off of which event? The hijrah. The hijrah. 
the Islamic new calendar. First of all, what year are we in? 1445. Who said that? There you go. Jazakallah khair. Rabbani barak fi. I know that you guys would get the 1440 part, but he got the five, which is the, the part you messed up. So if you just now learned that it's 1445, you can go ahead and unlearn it because it's only a few more days, and it's going to be 1446. So um, it's very important that we are proud of our heritage. That date is our date, our era, our, uh, our calendar as Muslims. I don't care what background you have. Muslims adopted this calendar from every single background across the whole world. Now, when you say 1445, that is 1,445 years since which event? Since Prophet Muhammad وسلم, left Mecca and went to Medina. It's not measured by when he started his da'wah, which would add another 10 or 13 years. It's not measured by when he passed away, وسلم. it's not measured by when they did this or that. It's measured by the moment that the Muslims officially had their own state or nation. We went from being a minority in Mecca to just having to hide and being persecuted and killed. Now the official first Islamic nation was in Medina. And that's why that the, the, um, the monumental event of Al-Hijrah and the sacrifices the believers had to make to do it was commemorated as the very first day of our calendar. Right? And that's coming up in a, just a few days, inshallah, uh, a week or two. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Uh, when you say the Muslim calendar is 1,445 years since the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca to go to Medina, the, w what year are we in now in what, what you would refer to as the normal calendar? 2024. That is 2,024 years since what happened? Say again. Since Isa ﷺ went to heaven, and they say, AD, after death, right? I know AD stands for something else as well, but the colloquial usage of it is after death. So they claim that Jesus السلام, died. Allah says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ right? uh, They did not kill him, and they did not crucify him. Rather, it, made, it was made to appear to them as, as such. They crucified somebody else. And Allah, بَلْ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ In fact, Allah lifted him up to the heavens uh, to wait alive until his appointed time to return back to earth, which is coming in, uh, perhaps in our lifetime, perhaps afterwards, wallahu alam, uh, to fulfill the rest of his duties, and then he will die a natural death, inshallah. So, 2,024 years since Christ was walking on this earth. And we believe that too. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that my brother, Isa, predated me by 600 years. So the Prophet وسلم, is about 1,440-something years, and then Isa وسلم, about 600 years prior. That leaves you with just about 2,000. So th those dates are accurate. Now, can we say for certain it's 2024 exactly? It doesn't make a difference. It's roughly in that range. That, that, that date is quite accurate. So notice how we call that the normal calendar, the normal days, normal dates, right? And then the Hijri one is like secondary. This is because the people who rule the world get to decide, right? They get to decide which one is normal. By the way, the superpower of the world for hundreds of years in which people used our calendar was the Muslim Ummah. And this was during al uh, the height of Al-Andalus. This was during the height of different uh, the different um, uh, powers, but primarily during the, the, the height of Al-Andalus. Because people would send their youth to our countries to learn, uh, to learn science and math and so on and so forth. So, Alhamdulillah, things change. And Allah says in the Quran, Tilka al ayamu bayna nas. Such are the days that we alternate between the people. One day yours, one day somebody else. And al aqibatu lil muttaqeen. The final result will be for the believers and the pious ones. However, you should never forget your heritage. As a Muslim from wherever you come, just like Christians from wherever they are, and now they've, they've made the whole world follow it, which is 2024, right? That is a Christian era, CE, right? Christian calendar. So... Don't, let, don't fall for the trick of shaitan to let it fall based on nationality or based on ethnicity or language spoken. Uh, we are all Muslims, we are all one, and we all take pride. And we are all inheritors, if we choose. We are all inheritors of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the, who are his true inheritors? He mentioned it in the hadith. Who are the true inheritors of the prophets? So, in, in a normal situation, who inherits you when you die? Your kids, your family. So that your closest people to you in this planet. So that means if, you if the Prophet said, my inheritors will be such and such a people, that means he's saying these are the closest people to me. And then he said, he explained, these will be my inheritors on the Day of Judgment. Who are they? 
those who believed in him without seeing him. amanu bi wa yarawni. So this hadith refers to ikhwani. The Prophet said, Wadatu law ra'aytu ikhwani. I wish I could have seen my brothers and my sisters. And the Sahaba said, Alasna ikhwanuk, O Messenger of Allah, aren't we your brothers? He said, Bal antum ashabi, you are my companions. However, my brothers will be those who will believe in me one day in future generations without ever having seen me. And I give them this title. They are my brothers and my sisters. Like he said, this is a close friendship and brotherhood. And I will see them. I wish I would have seen them before I could die. But he said, I will die before I see them. And on the day of judgment, inshallah, we will be reunited. So we pray that Allah allows us to be part of that honorable title of being Ikhwan and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, I'm looking for the inheritors. Warathatul Anbiya. The inheritors of the prophets. It's mentioned in the very famous hadith. Any takers? Al ulama, yes, Jazakum al Khairan. Wa inna al ulama u warathatul anbiya. Wa inna al anbiya u lam yu warithu dirhaman wala dinara. Walakin warathul ilm. Faman akhadahu akhada bihaddin wafir. Very, very famous hadith. In fact, this hadith was my biggest motivation for seeking knowledge. It started my whole journey as a teenager. My whole journey of applying and going overseas and studying in Mecca. This hadith was front and center. I still, I still remember who taught me it. It was Sheikh Muhammad Shinnawi, may Allah Ta'ala reward him. I still remember sitting through the 40 Nawi hadiths and, and those classes. And I still remember that was my, the moment. I heard this hadith and that was my moment. I said, this is what I want to do with my life. And the hadith is a bit longer and I'll share it with you now because I hope it encourages you to seek knowledge. The Prophet Sallallahu said, A'udhu bin Shajim, مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ بِهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ You guys may have heard this part for sure. Whoever seeks a path, whoever starts on a journey to seek knowledge, Allah will make a journey or a path easy for him or her to get to paradise. So every step you take towards seeking ilm and knowledge that gets you closer to Allah, you are taking steps towards Jannah. Allah will make those steps towards Jannah easy. So that's the first part of the hadith. And they said, وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَتَضَعُوا أَجْنِحَتَهَا لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ رِضًا بِمَا يَصْنَعُ Second part of the hadith, he said, the angels, when the student of knowledge, Talib al-ilm, walks on their path to go to the masjid, to go to the uh, uh, class, to go to a scholar, to go learn, to go to their Quran class and so on. When a student of knowledge is walking on the way from their home or from wherever they're headed, every angel that sees him or her will lower their wings out of humbleness for this person because of how honored they are to be in their presence. And this is Talib al-ilm. This is not even a scholar yet. This is a student of knowledge. When a student of knowledge is on their journey, every angel they pass by will lower their, their wings out of humbleness and humility. Um, those, now the Prophet is talking about the alim. So first we're talking about the student of knowledge, the one who's on the path to become a scholar. So now the Prophet moves on to the scholars. He said, as for the scholars, the, the whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth makes istighfar for the scholar. Hatta al even the whales in the depths of the ocean. Everything, every tree, every living creature, when a scholar passes by, it makes istighfar for him or her. Now this is for the scholar, it's not for the student. The student has to get there to that level. Now why does the scholar get this honor from that every single creature, every animal, even the fish in the oceans, when the scholar passes by, they make istighfar. They seek Allah's forgiveness for them. Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ say they praise him or her? Why did he say they make istighfar? Okay, so th their effect is exponential. So when they learn, they teach others. But that's a great, so that means they deserve that everybody, all the animals. So these animals technically benefit from this scholar. When this scholar learns that the Prophet ﷺ said, you should treat every living creature with mercy, even an animal. Some people don't believe in that, right? Guys, if you want to clear the way, come this way a little bit. So we can clear the way near the door. Jazakum khair. When the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ teaches that he taught us, and he did say this, that there, you should treat every living creature with respect or with, uh, with mercy. He said, even if you're going to slaughter an animal to eat it, you are not allowed to do it in front of the other animals. If you have a goat or a sheep or whatever, you're gonna, or chicken, you, it's, it's haram. You cannot kill it in front of the other chickens because you're going to cause them fear and, 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 uh, and pain just from watching that. He said also, you are not allowed to kill an animal that you're killing to, to eat with a dull blade. You're, you have to keep it uh, rested and, mer and treated with mercy. And he said, treat even the insects with mercy. Why should you kill just because 
you have the ability doesn't mean you're allowed to just kill insects because, you know, obviously pests and something is a different story. My point is, when the Prophet ﷺ says this to you, or he says this and the scholar learns it and then passes it on, those, as uh, Dr. Hisham mentioned, when, when the, 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 the scholar passes by these animals and these trees, this person has, is hopefully reach, doing exponential good because he or she teaches 100 people to treat the trees better. He, he or she teaches 100 people to treat the animals better. So when these animals see this person pass by, they say they make istighfar for them because they, they appreciate what they do and they appreciate their presence. What's another reason? Why did the Prophet ﷺ say, that the everything in the heavens and the earth makes istighfar for the alim. He didn't say they praise him, they praise the scholar. He said they seek forgiveness for him or her. Why specifically forgiveness? Yes. No one is worthy of praise besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fully worthy. No, it's a good, it's a good call. We, we, we don't seek knowledge to gain praise. So it should not be your goal. You should not say, I'm going to seek knowledge to get close to God. I want people to praise me. I want to sit in the big chair. I want to blow on the, on the water bottles and get a lot of money. I want, I want people to come to me and say, you know, you, uh, you know you're, you're the, the big boss and stuff. No, that is very um, lowly. The Prophet ﷺ advised whoever tries to seek knowledge that should get you closer to God. But their goal is for themselves. Their goal is to, to rise in terms of material benefits. Then their only direction is the hellfire. You should be humbling yourself. And if Allah honors you in this world because your reputation is better, because you're an honest person, that's a different story. That's a good thing. You should not be seeking, saying, well, what's in it for me? I'm going to go seek knowledge because there's big salaries, because you get prestige, because people respect you. That, if that's your intention, then the Prophet ﷺ said, on the day of judgment, you will learn that your only, the only path that you took was the path to the hellfire, even if you gain knowledge. So this, the sincerity, I think that's a great point. Never seek knowledge, sacred knowledge, or sincere knowledge, spiritual knowledge, because you want to be praised. Rather, you want to be humbled. You want to be spiritually cleansed. And then the praise may come because people like a good person. But it may not come. You may be tested. You may be living in a foul world where they treat a spiritually clean person in a foul way. Prophet Lut, alayhi salam, Prophet Lut was in a foul, corrupt society. And they said, أَخْرِجُوا آلَ لُوتٍ مِنْ قَرْيَتِكُمْ إِنَّهُمْ أُنَاسٌ يَتَطَهَّرُونَ they said, get, kick Lut and his family out of the, your town because they, they are so-called pure people. We don't want pure people around here. And they were persecuted. So you never guarantee that you'll get praise if you seek spiritual knowledge. But you're not seeking praise anyway. You want, you want um, to be humble in front of God. I think that's a good point. So Allah didn't incentivize it by saying, go seek knowledge to get praise. He said, no. Seek knowledge and the animals, even the animals will seek repentance for you. They will ask God to forgive you. Why don't we, th we assume... And we hope that scholars are the best amongst us. Why do they need all the animals to make istighfar for them, to seek Allah's forgiveness for them? Any thoughts, sisters? Yes. One more time. Thank you. Their mistakes are very consequential. Jazakum khairan. If a scholar makes a mistake, like like uh, Doctor mentioned, Doctor uh, Hisham mentioned earlier, that these they're influential. Their they're, they're khayr or their shar, their good or their evil, doesn't just affect themselves. They, they affect 100 people. So their mistakes can misguide and harm, cause a lot of harm if they make a mistake. Uh, what's another reason? Don't forget, this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is incentivizing us. He's encouraging us to seek knowledge. So he said, if you go and seek knowledge and you become a scholar, then even the fish will, will seek Allah's forgiveness for you. So he's encouraging you to become a scholar by giving you this reward. Why is it considered a reward that even the fish will seek Allah's forgiveness for you? Yeah, istighfar opens the door to risk, to provision, and also, but I'm, I'm looking for something else. I want, again, if I'm trying to convince you to go seek knowledge, I have to give you a reward that would convince you to do that, right? Istighfar, seeking God's forgiveness, or earn, if you, if you get God's forgiveness, if God forgives you, you go to paradise, you've been cleansed. You've been cleared. What else? But I'm looking for something specific. If no, I'll get one more voice, then i got to say it. Yes. The ink of the scholar is holier than the blood of the martyr. But how does this tie in here? Why is, it, why is the Prophet ﷺ incentivizing you to go seek knowledge by saying the animals will, seek, will, will ask Allah to forgive you? It's because of this. I want you to listen very closely. 
When you are a sincere Muslim and you're truly on the path of spiritual enlightenment, you're truly seeking knowledge to better yourself and to better others. You listening, fellas in the back? Guys, this is very, very important. When you are seeking knowledge, and then you, as you climb in knowledge, every scholar I've ever met, when I was in Mecca and I, Allah honored me to study there, and I'm talking to scholars who have white beards and they're very old and they've dedicated 30, 40 years to seeking knowledge and teaching it. The more knowledge you get, the closer you get to Allah, the more fearful you are of speaking. Because you know now the weight of your words. You know how much damage can be caused by saying the wrong things. And you know how much of an obligation it is to help. And you're worried, if I, what if I say the wrong thing? What if somebody comes to me for a fatwa and I give the wrong answer? What if I tell them that something wrong and I learn six years later or five years later, man, I, I should have told them yes or no. And they already acted upon it. And, and some harm was caused. So the more a person gains knowledge, the scholars used to say the, more a, the, the mark of a true student of knowledge is they get more and more silent. And I forgot who said this. He said that the, the problem with the world is that the, more, the wiser people usually are more silent but the more foolish people, they, they don't mind. They speak. They say whatever. They have no barriers. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, I know when you, if you ever become a scholar, our ummah, the world needs spiritual scholars, true or false. Otherwise, we're going to fall into collapse like we're seeing today. Yeah, you can get ahead in terms of material things and wealth and, and so on. But then look at society. It's collapsing, collapsing for our eyes. The materialism, the hedonism, the consumerism is literally, it's a result of um, uh, progress in terms of worldly levels, but look what it's causing. It's collapsing on top of itself. That's not the goal in and of itself. That's good, but it has to be accompanied with spiritual benefits or spiritual humbleness. That way, it can go hand in hand. When the spiritual aspect is lacking, society collapses. Society collapses, right? So, because we need scholars, but because a true scholar would hesitate to take the path and say, you know what? I'll suffice with just being a monk or going off on, on my own and just worshiping God. I don't want the responsibility of potentially saying the wrong thing. I don't want the responsibility of potentially misguiding others. The Prophet ﷺ said, well, you're needed. And I will, I'll encourage you to do so. I'll tell you the mistakes, the sincere mistakes you make along the way, everything in the heavens and the earth will, will seek Allah's forgiveness for you. The scholar, as they walk through the earth, male or female, Everything that Allah created will make istighfar for them, will seek Allah's forgiveness for them, even the fish in the oceans, because they need that, all the help they can get. They need all the incentives they can get. So when you go on to seek knowledge, you should never rush to issue a verdict. Never. This is a mistake a lot of people make. They learn one or two things online, and they go like, the next time somebody's asking about it, oh no, that's haram. That's halal, don't worry about it. It's like you're still at the very beginning of knowledge. You should leave that, you know, you should be afraid. You should be afraid to issue a verdict because... That's, what a tr that's a sign of true knowledge. And the, more, the irony or the paradox is the more knowledge you get, the more you're afraid to issue a verdict. So if it weren't for the case that it was needed, the scholars would never speak. Uh, Abu, um, Abu Hanifa, rahmahullah, one of the biggest scholars in our heritage, he is on record saying, and he was a qadi, he was a judge, he was a person who issued a lot of verdicts because he had to. And he was the smartest person and the most learned person in his entire era. He's on record saying that when I reflect on the, the work that I do, if I were able to, if it were permissible for me to never say, give another fatwa, I would do that. Because of how much I fear that I have to answer for all this on the Day of Judgment. What if I was wrong? What if I made mistakes? He's like, if I, if I, if I thought it was permissible for me, if it was allowed for me to stay silent, I would. But I have to. Somebody has to speak and help others. So he said, I pray that Allah forgives me for the mistakes I made along the way. And the rest of the hadith is that um, um, The virtue or the blessings of a scholar over the blessings of a worshiper, like a monk or somebody who goes off to worship, is like the, the virtue of the full moon compared to the other stars in the skies. When you look on the night of a full moon, how big is the moon compared to the other stars in the sky? It's, you, can't, you can't even compare. To the point where if it's the night of the full moon, you can't even see the stars. The shine of the moon completely blinds them. When it's a new moon, which is the beginning of the lunar month, where the moon is gone, you can't see it at all, that's when you can see the stars. And it slowly but surely fades by the time... When, the, when is it a full moon? The beginning of the month, the middle of the month, or the end of the month? The middle, right? The middle of the lunar calendar, uh, the middle of every lunar month, is, and it happens every single month, you get the full moon. And that is 
the difference, the Prophet said, the difference between the scholar and a worshiper. So it's similar to what you said earlier, where the worshiper, they, they learn knowledge. They learn how to worship. They learn how to go to Hajj. They learn how to fast. They learn how to do these good deeds. They, they read Quran every day. But at the end of the day, they're, they're benefiting primarily themselves. 90% of the time, it's just they're benefiting themselves. They might also obviously benefit their family and maybe a small circle around them. But, and they're doing good deeds. There's no sin. But the Prophet said, the difference though, if you want to know, if you want more encouragement to go seek knowledge and teach it, the difference is going to be like the full moon versus a star, the way that you see it in the sky. So you, you can make your choice. Both are good, but if you want to be the highest level. And then the final part, which for me was the final straw to convince me to seek knowledge uh, as, as, a, as a, my, a path in, in life was where the Prophet said, uh, um, he finally said, uh, he ended the hadith by saying, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets, and prophets did not leave behind dirha, uh, silver or gold, rather they left behind knowledge. So whoever takes it, whoever grabs onto that knowledge, has indeed received a good inheritance. So this is your opportunity to be an inheritor of the prophets, on the Day of Judgment, to be in that category. And that is like, you cannot be, the only person who inherits is the family, next of kin. So may Allah Ta'ala make us like family for the prophets. And you're, it's, your, it's, your it's your opportunity. In our era today, you can seek a path of knowledge. You can seek Islamic knowledge without having to leave your home. You know, from the computer, you can come to the mosque, which is nearby. You don't have to travel overseas. That's, that's a viable option because it isolates you. It takes you away from from distractions and you get focused for years uh, and that's usually a good path but it's not the only path anymore so um, and this opens doors a lot for sisters who traveling is not as uh, straightforward so so I encourage everybody here to seek knowledge as much as you can uh, and to with the intention of being humble and being closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I pray that Allah grants you and me the title of being inheritors of the prophets so we didn't get a chance to speak too much about hijrah but that's fine I just wanted to alert us the fact that hijrah we, it's just about the, the anniversary of the Hijrah is just about to come up, and that also marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar, which is going to be year 1446, 1446 years after the migration of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from Mecca to Medina. And there's a lot of lessons to take from it. I suppose in that case we might speak about it next week before the topic of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, because I want us to. Uh, some of the guys when I spoke about it earlier, uh, when I asked the questions, you guys both mentioned there are lessons to take in the situation in life today. So you mentioned what's happening in Palestine. You mentioned like our parents technically made hijrah. Many of us are second generation or first generation where, well, I guess that, that would be second generation, right? They came here first and then we are born here, many of us, or at least raised here. So that raises the question or begs the question, which comes, I mean, it's making its rounds online now. I'm sure many of you people have seen it on TikTok uh, where people are saying, well, hijrah in 2024, hijrah in the, in the 21st century, is that something people do? Are you supposed to migrate to protect your faith. I guess I suppose we can talk about that uh, in the future, inshallah, perhaps next week. Uh, but I, I have a few lessons here about what to extract from the hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. And I suppose we'll postpone that to next week. So with that said, any questions? Because I want to give you guys at least a little bit of time to see the mental health pop up. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Jazakul Khair. And it's a good question. Uh, it's a good uh, thought you said. There's no limits. You know, seeking knowledge, as is famously said, you seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. It's only bad. There's no, it, it, there's no downside. Now, the thing is, when this hadith is talking about seeking knowledge, ilm, it's talking about spiritual knowledge to get you closer to God. This doesn't mean we look down on seeking knowledge to get a career or to get educated in sciences. No, of course not. That is a great path, but we said it has to go parallel with building your Islamic, your spiritual foundation. We already observed today with our own eyes what a society that is very high progress when it comes to material but it's zero, almost zero. It's actually negative, going negative when it comes to spiritual. We see how the results of that. Society is eating itself apart. Society is collapsing from the inside. Uh, it's getting worse and worse. So that needs the spiritual uh, ilm to guide. And if Allah honors you, the Prophet ﷺ said, as the Day of Judgment draws near, those with spiritual knowledge will decrease. So that means it will be much more rare. That means it's much more valuable in the eyes of God. It might not result in extra money, probably won't. It might not result in extra status and fame and prestige, probably won't. But that's actually better for you. That means you can keep your intention sincere for God. And on the day of judgment, 
the the people of knowledge will be distinguished. So definitely go hand in hand, seek knowledge. There's no, you're right, there's no limit from the cradle to the grave, but always keep that in mind. Material progress without spiritual progress leads to collapse and destruction. Any questions, sisters? Even if it's not related, I know maybe people had the istikhara question too. Anything? All right. Last call. All right, with that, inshallah, we'll pause. Yes, oh, there you go. To, be, to get, receive an answer. So the concept of istikhara, for those who are unaware, it means, the word istikhara means to ask Allah to direct you towards good. To ask Allah to direct you towards what's good or what's better. So what you're doing is, it's a dua, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu advised us to make, it's a supplication. It's a dua, obviously it includes a prayer. So what you do is you pray two rak'at, two regular rak'at, and then you lift your hands up to Allah you, after you say salam. You could do it before salam. Usually I recommend doing it after because you could read the dua off of a paper. Most people don't have it memorized. So you pray two rak'at and then you recite the dua of istikhara in which it's half, about half a page where you say, and I recommend you do it in Arabic, read it in Arabic, and then read it in English so you can know what you're saying. The ritual is to read it in Arabic, but you should also know what you're asking Allah. What you're saying is, oh Allah, I have a big decision to make. If it is good for me, then allow it, then bless it for me and make my path towards it easy. And if this decision is bad for me, then asrifu anni wa asrifni anhu. Get it away from me and get me away from it. Waktub lil khayra haythu kana thumma ardani bih. And decree for me what is best and then allow me to be satisfied with that. Because sometimes I'm not satisfied. My heart was in one direction. I really thought I wanted to go there. But Allah is showing you that it's a bad direction. So you're saying, oh Allah, I know that I may be emotionally un re unready to accept your decision, so allow my heart to be ready with that. That's the dua you're making. So the main way that Allah, so there's, there's three ingredients that you need to do when you pray istikhara. Number one, you pray the istikhara, you can do it before or after, like the timeline is not that important. But num number two, uh, it, when I say before or after, not before or after you make the decision, before or after these next steps. The, the, the three steps are dua, like uh, and sincere intention towards Allah. Second is istikhara, and the third is shura. This is where p most people fail, shura. Shura meaning consultation. And you, you consult. So if you're going to buy a new car, who are you going to consult? Your friend who's a mechanic, your uncle who knows cars really well. You're not going to consult a friend just because he or she is a trustworthy friend. They don't know about cars. What could they offer? You, I mean, I'm saying you can, you can consult them, I guess, if they have some experience in life, but you don't give their opinion that much value with all the respect because they're not an expert on this issue. You always consult the people who are best suited for this issue. Istikhara, most people do it for marriage and for getting a job and for moving. Those are the three big, getting a job, moving, marriage, and education, I guess, as well, right? So marriage is the big one, right? And people are waiting for Allah to just direct their heart. So you got to do shura. you got to do shura because two heads are better than one. And people, and you do shura when, when it comes to marriage, you do shura with elders. You do shura with people who have had that experience, people who, ha who are not in the same boat as you, who are just as confused as you are, right? Then what's the point? They're just going to give you, they might give you advice that they mean well, but they don't know better. So their advice might be terrible. So you, part of you humbling yourself for Allah is saying, I'm going to seek external advice. Maybe three people who I really trust, my mentor, my mother, or, and my, my, you know, my, my older brother. So these are really people who are ahead of me, who they say, hey, listen, that's a red flag. It doesn't look like a good idea. The number one way through which Allah answers your istikhara is through shura. The number one way, most common way that Allah answers your istikhara, you say, oh Allah, guide me towards this or guide me away from it. The number one way Allah answers it is that your shura comes back in one direction or the other. You ask three people, two of them said, bad idea. That's it. That's your answer. And these are people you trust, people who have some experience in this field. You go, you're buying a new car, you ask a mechanic, you ask your uncle who's really good with cars, and maybe you ask your friend who's really good with cars. And they say, two of them say, oh no, terrible idea. One of them says, hey, maybe it could work out. I mean, it's, maybe you get a fourth opinion or whatever. Like, bottom line is, it leans in one direction or the other. Very rarely does it not lean in one direction. At least sometimes it's decisive. In my experience, and this is from Allah's blessing. When you do istikhara and you're praying to Allah to guide your heart, Allah makes it decisive. Where it's very clear. Like, almost nobody says no. And this has happened, I'm sure you've experienced this as well. That's the number one way through which Allah answers your, your dua istikhara. The second way through which Allah answers it is if it's a no... Because you're saying, oh Allah, if this is bad for me, then get it away from me and get me away from it. So one of the 
most common ways is that Allah blocks your path to that thing. You're looking to get a new job and then it just doesn't work out. You're looking to marry this person and it just doesn't work out. Now this is not, if you don't do shura, you will not have closure about this part. Because you'll always wonder, but what if it didn't work out because of some other things? What if I just didn't take the correct steps? But that's why you, you, you take all the steps. And shura is a lot of the ways that you get closure. The people who you trust tell you it's either a good idea or a bad idea. Right? That's usually the way. Now the dreams thing, very rare. But it does happen on occasion. Like getting confirmation from a dream. Very rare. So you shouldn't rely on it. Any other questions? Okay. So with that said, inshallah, we'll stop right here. Great question. Does the person you asked have to be a mu'min, like a good believer? The, usually yes. Especially if the issue is to deal with anything religion related. So if it's buying a new car, perhaps, probably not. Yeah, that, that should be fine. If he's not Muslim, like it's a mechanic, he's not Muslim because your, your values don't really play a role here. You're, but like when it comes to marriage, for example, you ask your really close friend who's not Muslim, they're going to they're gonna give you a sincere advice. They don't share your values though. It's very important. Like, there's no disrespect. It's just they don't see... Their, their answer is going to come based on the, their entire package that they've had 30 years worth of experiences. But they don't have they share the foundational principles. When you tell them, I'm looking to marry this person and this is the qualities, good or bad, what do you think? This is what I think I might have an issue with. Good idea. They're going to give you their advice with sincerity based on what they believe, how they see the world. But that's not what you're looking for, with all respect. So yeah, you, and you go to a believer, even or let's say it's a Muslim friend or, or a relative, who doesn't pray, doesn't share Islamic values, then it's just the same problem. So it's no disrespect. It's about you want an answer based on, uh, like you, if it's related like marriage, etc., to, to values. I'll give you a, actually another example that doesn't relate to marriage. Clo a true story. A friend of mine was was looking, got a great job offer in a different state, uh, and he got another job offer in the same state. One pays quite a bit less. They're both very comfortable salaries, six figures. But one of them was a bit, quite a bit less, noticeably less than the other. He ended up doing, you know, he prayed his tikhar, he asked some friends, he, he took the wrong decision. He took the job that paid more, but it was 45 minutes away from the nearest mosque. And the other one that paid a little bit, noticeably less, maybe 20, 30% less, it was right by the mosque. And this is a different state. So he moved out, and I remember he came back to, to New York just to visit one time, and he, he spoke to me, he's like, I made the terrible decision. Like, I'm, uh, he has kids at home, he's like, I feel very stressed out. My kids are not growing up at the mosque. They don't have a community. Uh, the money wasn't worth it. And you know, I'm stressed out every day. I'm trying to quit this job as soon as possible and get it. I don't care. He learned that there's things more important than money. And I just want my kids to grow up to have a community. Like, that, that was worth the difference. And so, subhanAllah, Allah gave him the answer. He didn't, you know, his heart couldn't take it. And he accepted that he was, you know, the, the, it's not like sinful. Because you can't know for 100% sure. He said, let me try it out. And he learned. And he was feeling his heart told him this was a bad idea. And over time, he fixed it. But he had to... Learn that way, the hard way. So that's a true story where, let's say in that case he asked istikhara from, or he asked shura with somebody who doesn't share his values, where the mosque is not that important. And he's like, come on, you can always drive out there, it's no big deal. And he, you know, that's, that's what the, your friend will give you that advice because he wants best for you. He thinks in his eyes that money is better for you, but in this case it wasn't. So that's, that, that's one example where if your morals and your values play a role in the answer, then don't trick yourself by asking somebody who, d who doesn't exemplify those morals and those values. Wallahu alam. Yes. Well, that's a great idea, great question. So education is a very important one. You got to see which direction to go with your career, direction to go with your life, right? So you're going to probably ask more people. This is one question where you ask a lot of people. As opposed to like other things, it's more, marriage is more private, you ask two or three. Education, just you got to keep asking. You got to keep, because you don't even know your path, right? Go to career fairs, keep it broad. But ultimately, you will include, I'm not saying only single out Muslims, but eventually you're going to say, you want to find a Muslim in that career and ask them, hey, how is it to be a Muslim in this field? Like, I've, many of you guys have told me, oh, they do social events where that's where you get to sit with the boss and where promotions happen, but it's always at a bar and this and that. And like, they tell you the social atmosphere is terrible here for Muslims or that. So you want to factor that in. Now, it's not going to, it's, it's usually not going to make or break your, your career path, but it's, this is where you would include the believer who, who you aspire to be. This person keeps their faith. They have a good foundation of knowledge. They keep their relationship with Allah and they're succeeding in this career. I want to hear what they have to say. So you include them, but you don't, it's not just them. So I hope that answers the question. Don't, don't neglect that. Because I've seen people who, when they want, when they want to tend for their spirituality, they, they re 
regret neglecting that aspect. All right? So I'll, I'll let you guys go now just because, I mean, it's a few minutes left, but I want you to be able to check out this mental health pop-up right outside, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bhamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Jazakumullah khairan, and we will see you on 7.30, inshallah, 